unless you have a question to ask, anything like that. As you've seen, we are recording this session. The link will be available to the recording after this meeting. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or ask them in the chat and we will try our best to get to all of them. Um, and then just a reminder, if you haven't yet signed up for our newsletter, please do so. Um, and I will get started on introducing our speakers for today. If you were lucky enough to catch our webinar last week, I've already introduced the wonderful Mike Addison and Zelinda van der Madver. Today we'll be focusing on Aubrey Sneeman and Michael Schaefer. So Aubrey founded Multiprof Intelligence in 1998 and qualified as a town and regional planner at the University of Pretoria in 1980 after which he spent the next 10 years gaining experience as a senior town planner at the City Council of Pretoria in the Department of Housing. In 1990, he started acting as a consultant for the industry and his ability to connect the dots led to the establishment of Multiprof Intelligence, a versatile yet focused consulting enterprise offering a spectrum of services, including town planning, architecture, and property information. Aubrey is extremely passionate about sharing his vast amounts of knowledge and his ever popular training sessions, including a variety of topics ranging from town planning to personal development. In his spare time, Aubrey loves to travel the world and is an avid member of the couch surfing and human library community. Michael Schaefer is a former director and co-principal of the national property group Trafalgar, where he was the driving force behind Trafalgar's financial services capability, while also overseeing Trafalgar's Gauteng and Western Cape operations for 18 years. After identifying an opportunity in the market to better cater for bodies, corporates and scheme finance, an area grossly underserviced, he started ZDFIN in early 2020. Michael has more recently added the executive managing agent service and offering to ZDFIN's bouquet of offerings and one that is growing traction as one of the few truly independent companies offering the service. Michael's background and experience in property management and property financial services positions him perfectly to assist schemes with their financial requirements and associated challenges. Perfect. Over to our first poll I see. Right. <clears throat> Carl, you. over to you. No, it's Carl, are you oh, going to Carl. handle this one? <clears throat> okay. So um, I'll, I'll mention it though, Carl, if you're going to handle the poll for us. Um, so we're just interested today uh, because we do have a couple of questions later um, and we're not going to have too many polls. They do take up time, but we'd be interested to know um, the breakdown so that when we asked the polling questions just now, we, we're going to be asking managing agents and trustees. Okay, so there's enough trustees here to ask that po question. Super. Okay, the results will get published just now. <clears throat> For those of you who are interested, there's 22% trustees, 61% managing agents so far. Trustees are chasing up to 23% <laughs> for running commentary. 18% owners and others are like brokers and things, I suppose, 14%. Mike, Kim has also said on the group, Kim van Niekerk of Major Kim, there should also be one for all of the above. I agree with you. <laughs> all of the above, plus, plus a true, couple more. True, true. Shame for them, if you're all of them. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Carl, I think we can end the poll and then you can put the results up for everybody can see, but there we go. Okay, so interesting stat. Okay, so most of us are managing agents this morning and then there's a um, handful of trustees. So that's great. Carl, then we can do that other poll later. Okay, moving on. Okay, so we started in Cape Town, as you know, last week. Um, it was a lovely day in Cape Town last week. Um, and then we walked up uh, the road in Seapoint to our building. But um, just to get into the mood, um, oh, 
Well, there we go. I just thought uh, we would remind everybody in other parts of the country that Cape Town is a little bit cooler this morning. So there we go. Have you got, I'm sure you're all really dressed up. Johannesburg is cooler, but not, not, not unpleasant. A bit of a warmer day for us today. Okay, so um, I'm starting this morning just outside the building. You see the road on the right. That's where we traveled up. We did some work around the side of the building last week. Um, we had a chat about the exclusive use area garden. We came to the front. We looked at those gates and the gardens, and we came around to this corner um, where Zelinda took us through what to do with this mulberry bush and so on. But this morning, um, we're going to start off here with this interesting little part, um, which is this building um, have or allowed, I suppose, and it's many years ago, I think it's been there for about 20 years, for the owner uh, at the balcony to extend um, a, a wooden structure, um, I call it a wooden deck, and it covers those two garages, they are actually part of the building, they are sections, so there's two section garages. Um, and yeah, we're going to chat about that this morning. Zalinda, I don't know if you are up to it, um, or um, you want us to carry on? Um, we're going to carry on with that. Hi there, Mike. So sorry. For everybody's uh, benefits, I have not been feeling that great. I've got a bit of a tummy bug. So I asked my colleagues to please take over for me this morning. But I obviously have FOMO and decided to jump on and take over <laughs> as I always do. So <laughs> Nicole and Kyle, I'm, I'm so sorry for that. That's just part of who I am. Um, Mike, and on that note, I am always happy to jump in. So I am also okay. going to take a walk along Sea points. I am so cold that I'm still in my gown and my slippers if you don't mind that's why the camera is off so let's go um, let's <laughs> right on this building and uh mike let's remind me about what we wanted to chat about about this particular one and uh and then we can do that okay so what's what's going to what where we are we we arrived here and now we're looking at this lot so linda's going to take us through um uh, very briefly I, I would expect um about how, how to go about giving this owner permission um, to have this extension. Um, she's going to tell you about creating an EUA rule um, because last week we focused on, you know, the section 27 rule, I think you call it, um, which is a registered rule. And we looked at that, the other ones, this one would be a rule created exclusive use area, which Linda can explain. And then Aubrey <clears throat> is going to help us explain from a municipal point of view, on what we should be looking at, bearing in mind that this is um, an Art Deco type of building. Okay, so when we just to before Zelinda starts, so we looked at this last week. This is what I meant about the register. The, these exclusive use areas were registered, these ones, um, but now we're going to be creating an exclusive use area over those two garages. Okay, Zelinda, it's over to you. Fantastic. It's such an interesting one that we actually started working on this. And <clears throat> when Mike showed me his uh, slideshow presentation that he had prepared, I said to him, this one looks very, very familiar. And I started going back into the into the records in the brain chambers. And it turns out that it's one that Nicole Null and I had recently worked on. And we had put together an exclusive use area rule in terms of the conduct rules. And I think we had actually recommended that Aubrey prepare the layout plan for this particular um, conduct rule. And uh, I'm sure that Aubrey's going to have a lot to say about it. And this deck had actually been at the scheme for 20 odd years. Um, but because there's been a change in ownership, as is normally the case, the owners are wanting to formalize the use of this common property. And the best way to do that, in our opinion, at least, and I'm sure is agreed upon by our colleagues, is to do that as, for, as part of an exclusive use area. Now, in this particular case, this exclusive use area might not necessarily have had the correct building approval and local authority approval, which is what Aubrey will touch on, but there are different options that can be looked at when you formalize 
common property. And one could look at a lease, and we know that a lease agreement needs a special resolution. My clients always hate me when I tell them that you need a special resolution per lease agreement, per owner or occupier. You cannot allow the trustees to enter into a multitude of lease agreements by one special resolution. It is a special resolution per lease agreement, per owner, or occupier. So obviously that's not a route that you're wanting to follow because you're going to have to get a special resolution each time. If you're going to have to go the special resolution route each time, why not just go the exclusive use area route? The easiest route to go would be the conduct rule-based route, and that is a special resolution, amendment of the conduct rules, submission to the community scheme ombud service. We know they're supposed to take 30 days to review and approve it, and then a layout plan that um, professionals like Aubrey can prepare and a schedule of allocation. In this particular scheme, while they were investigating the formalization of this particular deck, they noticed that there were quite a few other areas of common property that needed to be rectified and exclusive use areas created. This image doesn't really do it justice, does it, Mike? Because when we look at a different, um, uh, what would you say, different, uh, yeah, there, there we go, that one. You see just how, uh, in inverted commas, messy this was done. You mentioned that the scheme was a heritage one. And if you look at the picture on the top left, you said that it was actually cut into the building to create the stairway. I don't know if you want to you want to speak about that specifically, or you want to hand over to Aubrey to talk about that. But from a formality perspective, and I think that that balustrade or that missing balustrade issue is another conversation that we can have there as well. From a formality perspective, this is an exclusive use area, conduct rule, special resolution. The alternative would be management rules, unanimous resolution, or to have it registered, again, a unanimous resolution, but then you would need to appoint an architect or a land surveyor to amend the sectional plans and a conveyancer to have that registered. Now with the community scheme ombud service and the ability to have an order that you reasonably require exclusive use, you may as well go the route of a conduct rule, lower level resolution, special resolution to have an exclusive use area, as opposed to going the registered or management rule based route, which is normally the route that is followed by developers at the establishment of the body corporate or the opening of the sectional title register. So I think this is a prime example of how the body corporate so desperately wanted to formalize this particular owner's use of the common property that perhaps they didn't look deeper into the elements that Aubrey is going to take us through. Um, Mike, I think that's all I want to talk about from a sectional title legal <clears throat> perspective on this note. Yeah, okay. So uh, just before Aubrey takes over, so just so it doesn't look so bad. Um, the reason why it's in bad condition, this this uh, uh, call it uh, wooden structure at the moment, is because these photographs come from it when it was in claim. So a storm has just gone past, and it's actually taken out part of the you know balustrades and things. So that's why it's a bit broken today. Okay, so overlook that. Pretend that it's all in good order. Aubrey, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mike and Sir Linda. Uh, this is really a very interesting case study, and um, as you've heard before, my passion is connecting the dots between all the different rules and regulation and laws that is applicable, um, and perhaps I can just start by saying that um, any sectional title development is built on top of a huge amount of existing laws, rules, regulations, and one cannot uh, not uh, obey those rules and regulations and the laws. And therefore, one must, whenever any decisions uh, are taken by trustees or uh, with the support of the managing agents, one really needs to go back to the basics of the zoning of the property, of the national building regulations and then in this case specifically something like um, the national heritage resources act of uh, 1999 whereby uh, these limitations placed on making additions and alterations to any heritage building and uh, that would mean any building older than 60 years now, that is not that practical at this stage anymore because uh, in places like Swane, 
Um, 80% of all uh, existing old houses now uh, fall into that category. But in this case specifically, I think it, it's a, a very important to note that um, this uh, type, this building style comes from the 1930s. So it, uh, it is really something that is worthwhile protecting. And um, in this case, uh, I hear this was done about 20 years ago. I can just imagine how the process went when this owner at the stage sent a, a two-liner to the trustees and asked them for permission to uh, erect a, a balcony on top of the existing uh, uh, roof. And um, I can imagine, and I'm, I'm sure if one go back to the records, the trustees would have answered with a one-liner stating uh, we give you approval. Now, of course, the, that approval given by the trustees have very little value if it does not take into consideration all the underlying laws that needs to be adhered to. And therefore, I again, and that's my favorite sentence, um, for trustees and for managing agents to make uh, trustees aware of that whenever any approval is given for new structures um, or additions or alterations, one should always refer to the existing uh, other rules and regulations that's not necessary only sectional title and therefore any approval should always read something like uh, the trustees or the body corporate having principle, no objection to the request on condition that all town planning scheme, all national building regulation and all other sectional title rules and regu regulations are adhered to. Um, that would just make the uh, person that asked for for this uh, um, addition or alteration, make him aware of the fact that there's lots of other rules and regulations to, conser to, to consider. And for instance, uh, building plans need to be adhered to. You need to submit building plans. Uh, in that process, council will see if uh, aspects like uh, coverage is affected, floor area ratio, parking requirements, uh, the safety of the structures, uh, civil engineer might be required. Um, and as we see, um, is worthwhile protecting. And unfortunately, this did not happen. And therefore, the moment that uh, application is made to council uh, for approved building plans, they uh, should insist that uh, the, the heritage permission is also required. And um, without knowing the full situation, there is a possibility that uh, from a heritage point of view, that this cannot be supported or will not be supported. And that will leave one with the very difficult situation where it's already there. It, people, owners, new owners bought it 10 to one and they might have bought it specifically because of this um, addition that they're not aware of that is an addition. Uh, it was approved as part of the exclusive use area, CSOS have in a way um, also approved it then as part of the rule without understanding the consequences of not uh, starting at the beginning. Uh, and as I said, that would be the zoning, uh, that would be the national building regulations um, and any other rules and laws as, as the one that is, is applicable here. Um, so it, it's very difficult to, to know 
how you're going to deal with this should this owner not be able to get approval from the municipality for an approved building plan uh, for various reasons. And of course, any structure, uh, even where the change, where there's a change of use, need a new building plan. For instance, if you have a, a garage that you convert into a living area, um, we often hear, but we have changed nothing. It's exactly as it is. Uh, we changed nothing. We just took out the door and put in windows. So as if that's nothing. But even the change of use of a room or a structure needs approved building plan. What is acceptable um, standards like ceiling heights for a garage is not necessarily adequate for a living room. So um, for any changes and also internal changes where there's uh, uh, structural changes or changes to plumbing, it is necessary to obtain building plan approval. And in that process, council will um, inquire an engineer, for instance, um, this specific deck, there's no proof that it is safe. Um, the fact that it's there for 20 years give us indication that it was built properly, but uh, council will not necessarily accept that. They will inquire um, a certificate from a civil engineer to say that it's safe, but more importantly, they would need approval um, as far as the heritage status of this building is concerned. Um, and therefore, I think one, one must be careful registering exclusive use areas, um, giving it more uh, status without knowing that uh, all the uh, rules that underpin uh, the structure is, is in place. Um, I don't know if, if we, we will next week look at a few other aspects of additions and alterations. Um, but I think for now, that is what I want to contribute on this specific deck. Okay, great. Um, Aubrey, I appreciate that very much. Aubrey mentioned an, a clause that you could put in, and um, I was most impressed. Uh, Aubrey and I attended a, a NAMA function last week, and uh, Aubrey handed out a very nice brochure uh, with a clause that's actually on the back. So the clause is actually here. So uh, 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 Jenny from his office kindly shared um, the PDF version of this a nice little brochure. Aubrey, would you be happy if I share it? Obviously, I'm putting you on the spot here with everybody in due yes. course. So you will make think... me very happy if you do that because we <laughs> so, will solve a few problems if we can get that standardized in the yeah. industry. So remember the clause. I will share this document with you in due course. It might not be this week. It might be when we've got a few things, but we're certainly going to communicate with all of the people that have attended. So yeah, that will go out to everybody. Okay. So I think time we, we're going to move on. Aubrey, thank you so much. That was that was awesome. I didn't know how we were going to get past this prickly pear, and you've you've dealt with it brilliantly. Thank you so much. Right, we, we can also come back to this. So remember, if anybody's got questions, send them. And then next week, we can always come back to a picture. We've made we've made this, although we've got a sort of program that we've sort of set out, we are very flexible. Michael Schaefer is not going to uh, tell us stuff, but we'll go back to Michael next week in need, if need be, or carry on with it next week, depending on how, how things go. Okay, very flexible here this morning. Right, moving on to the next one. There we go. Back to Johannesburg. Sorry about the ground. Let's point the camera upwards rather. So, um, yeah, we're in Santon. Uh, for uh, Aubrey's sake, no, we're not in Johannesburg. We're in Gauteng. Huh? You didn't want me to leave uh, uh, Pretoria or for anything out for that matter. <clears throat> so, we're in the um, Gauteng area, and uh, Michael is sitting in Santon, I assume. Um, and it's much warmer up here today so far. 
So first of all, before Michael gets going, we will be interested. So this is for the managing agents. Most of you are managing agents this morning. We established that. So Kyle, if you could start the poll, we're interested to know. So just to explain why we're doing the poll, um, because everybody's dealing with EUAs differently in terms of the financial aspects, collecting the contributions. So we're interested with a, with a, um, our perception is that most people don't deal with it. So don't worry, tell the truth because um, we're not, it's anonymous. Okay, so you can be quite happy that you can actually say that you do nothing about it. I'm interested to see how many hardly any schemes, otherwise we'd upset the apple cart. Okay. Our perception, which we could have done a poll, but it would have just taken too much time while the people are putting their numbers in. Um, I have found through working nationally with the number of buildings we look after nationally, is that I find that in Port Elizabeth it seems to be done very well. In Cape Town, second on the chart, they seem to managing agents and bodies corporate seem to do the EUAs quite well. And then in Johannesburg, and I don't know about Pretoria, I don't have so many buildings in Pretoria, but certainly in the Johannesburg area, there's so many de facto uh, EUAs, there's not much formality there, okay, from what I can see through my client base, but I might be looking at it through a, a smaller prism, okay, a smaller lens, I should say, narrower lens. Okay, so, Kyle, I think we can end the poll, I think that's interesting. Okay, so hardly anybody corporate, otherwise we would upset the apple cart. Now, it's strange. I, I would have expected an 80% there, and we have a 21% there. So that was an interesting result. So, Carl, if you can stop hearing that. Oh, there we go. Did we share the results? Let's share them. Happy. Okay, so next one, the second one. Um, seems like my PowerPoint a bit slow this morning. Okay, so poll three. So for the trustees, we'd be interested to hear the trustees' input on this. As trustees, would you attend to EO contributions? Um, in other words, would you became, you became a trustee, you watched this webinar, or you had a look and you thought, oh, should we do something about our ones or not? Um, are you going to just leave it as it is, or are you going to, oh, no, let's go and regularize it. Let's go and get it right. Just interested in your in your perception there. What are your thoughts? I'm not going to hold you to it. Just interested in what your attitude would be. Okay, that's interesting. So the vast majority seem to prefer to regularize it. It's about 91% that would prefer to regularize it. And about 9 or 10% seem to actually prefer to leave the status quo. And that's interesting. Okay, that's an interesting stat for everybody. And should we end the poll? Carl, I think I'll end it. And we'll share the results. Interesting, huh? 8% had actually, 8% preferred to leave the status quo. Okay, I would have also expected a more 50-50 there. Interesting. What you think the the result would be are, are proven here to be so obviously different. Okay, let's move on. Michael is dying to tell us stuff this morning. Um, yeah, so Michael has been properly introduced. Um, I, I want to just add to that. Um, Michael and I have been working together now um, since uh, ZDFIN, I call it ZDFIN. Um, ZDFIN, I hear is the correct pronunciation. Um, it's actually ZDFIN. So, is it ZDFIN? So I'm right. I always say ZDFIN. It's just a lazy okay. D. Okay. Oh, sorry. Good. Yes. <laughs> My apologies, Michael. I thought <laughs> I was wrong. Pretty I much I was everything. Wrong. <laughs> the woman dominates an office, so we've been decent to submission. No, that's great. So Michael and I have been working together on many things in Johannesburg. Um, so just so that Michael gets some advertising in. Um, 
primarily financing. So financing your schemes, um, you need to regularize something like you want to spend money to get your EUAs right, or you want to do a project, you want to get um, uh, solar on your roof. Um, you know, Michael's the guy to finance it, I can assure you. Um, they also do ex executive managing agencies. Um, he's looking after a few schemes and the schemes that he's working with that we have been appointed to the insurance broker. They're doing a phenomenal job and making a huge difference. So, Michael, there we go. It's great working with you and it's great to have you with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. And and I know you've done a lot of research uh, and getting the wide range of opinions here, bringing them all together. So I'm dying to hear. Um, so over to you. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Mark. And thanks to, to Zalinda as well for inviting me. Um, and yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for suffering through my, my little time here. Um, so Linda and Mike asked me to specifically focus on, you know, EMA contributions and just sort of the computation and, and perhaps an, an example or two. So, you know, just from, from practical experience, I've been in the industry for, for a fair bit of time. Um, you know, my, my take on it all is that, that EUAs are particularly badly managed, you know, for a whole multitude of reasons. And, you know, I, you know it's not, it's certainly not the managing agents, you know, sort of fault. You know, I think it's a combination of, of you know, kind of apathy, uh, lack of time, skills, know-how. It's it's a whole multitude of, of factors. So you know, there's 62 percent managing agents here. So I'm sure the slide I'm kind of preaching to the to the converted. Um, you know, you guys are expected. You know, my previous life I was a managing agent. You know, you expect it to be everything from accountants, attorneys, engineers, project managers, counselors, mediators, forces, parents. You know, and the list goes on you know, often for very little thanks and, and remuneration. Um, you know, very often my favorite line at, at, you know, budget meetings with trustees, you know, the two things they always want to suppress is management fee and insurance. You know, those are the two things that, you know, their mind goes down. And, you know, I always reminded them, you know, what do you pay your domestics? And, you know, very often, you know, the domestic sort of salary is, is more than what, you know, they want to pay the managing agents. Um, you know, which always is like an interesting kind of, you know, fact to, to, to share, you know, and then trusting the management of their, you know, arguably their single largest asset, you know, to someone that they want to pay less than they pay, pay a domestic. And it's, you know, for the skill set that's required, covering all of the different sort of disciplines, um, you know, that you guys are, are expected to sort of fulfill. So, you know, I think the take out is, is that just, you know, the capacity of a, a managing agent is, is hugely limited, um, you know, and massively stretched. And, you know, we then go to, you know, take ones. When you take on a new building, you know, in my experience, very often buildings don't move for nothing. They typically are issues. You know, it's a hassle to move. Um, so when they do move, there are generally issues that need to be addressed sort of relatively quickly. And, you know, very often they, you know, the handovers are frustrated by hostile, you know, previous MAs who are trying to do their best to sort of sabotage your take on to put you in a bad light. Um, you know, so during that whole process, you know, a physical inspection on site, you know, comparison to plans, et cetera, et cetera, you know, is, is very difficult, um, you know, to actually do. And I'd also argue not, not immediately within the scope, you know, of a managing agent sort of like contract. I mean, you know, what do we know going to have a look at, at you know, sort of plans versus, you know, the practical, you know, layouts of a scheme, you know, that's for someone like Arby to to go and look and advise upon, um, you know. So from the outset, you know, it's 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 very difficult, or you know, it, it, you kind of inherit a scheme as it is, and you know, and then before we know it, you know, a couple of years have gone down the line, and you know, nothing's nothing's kind of changed. Um, you know, just practically, um, you know, we find you know de facto EUAs, alienation, common property, extension of sections are legally done. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, the older the scheme, generally the more the more the number of issues, you know, which I suppose is, is common logic. I mean, just back to EMAs, you know, we manage six EMA buildings now at the moment, and four of them, you know, have all got issues. Um, and, you know, the two that don't have issues is just because they're more pressing issues. We haven't even gotten there, you know, trying to keep lights on, uh, dealing with hijacked units. So I'm pretty sure that they've also got issues. So it's definitely an area that, that is poorly managed. Um, you know, certainly not the MA's fault, in my opinion, but I think because of the, the financial implications, you know, and the potential issues that can arise, 
I think it's important that it remains on the proverbial kind of radar and something to get to and not to forget about until there is an issue that then becomes an issue. Um, you know, just in terms of the research and just trying to get some sort of practical examples because I'm lazy, um, it was quite interesting. You know, the general consensus, you know, from a lot of my, my former colleagues, as well as MAs that we're dealing with now, obviously deal with a far greater range, is that very often, you know, it's just thumb sucks. You know, there's very little, you know, and that's that's a generalized comment. So, you know, certainly there are MAs, I'm sure, that, that go into, you know, great detail in terms of, of computing the UA uh, contributions. But, you know, I just find that, you know, very often they, they're kind of poorly done. And so it's sort of a thumb suck number that isn't necessarily, you know, got any sort of logical, you know, sort of basis. So I just sort of, you know, that it was just interesting. It's been a very interesting exercise to me. And as I say, you know, blended with, you know, my time back at Trafalgar, where it definitely was poorly managed, um, you know, and it's, but yeah, we, we, we kind of know why. Anyway, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so just a just a recap on the you know the creation of the EUAs. Um, you know, I don't want to dwell here. I think that, that this has been covered, but you know, effectively the developer opening the register, you know, through the rules, you know, the second points, and I think that's where the majority of, of us will all play, you know, trying to regularize um, EUAs that have been sort of you know de facto EUAs, let's put it that way, that need to be done as cost effective, it's relatively easy, the the, the the approval level is low, and then just the, the section 27, which, which Mark covered more in depth last week. Okay, so let's just go on. Go on, next one. Okay, cool. Um, just in terms of the calculation of the EA levies, um, it's important to understand the, the, the legislative directive and intent. Um, I'm certainly not going to read 31C. Um, it's there for you guys just to cruise over, and I'm sure you all know it a lot more than me. But, you know, having a look at it, it's, it's difficult to argue the logic and the intent. And, you know, but, you know, the take out, it's important to understand what that is. And I think it's, it's pretty simple. It's just that all costs, you know, and that's a definitive set of costs, you know, must be recovered from, you know, the owners that enjoy, you know, have enjoyment of those exclusive use areas. And, you know, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, I don't think that there, there's anything wrong with that, but it's important that we do understand that because that certainly is the, the basis of, of, of any um, contribution that needs to be computed. Um, what I've said there is just the, the most common EUAs. Um, it's, it's not meant to be a, a definitive list. There certainly are more, but it's just the common, the common ones that, that most of us will be aware of. It's the gardens, garages, carports, balconies, um, and storerooms, um, which, is, which is interesting. Okay, next slide, Carl. Okay, um, just in terms of the rules, um, you know, we can, we can in the rules, uh, make it the owner responsibility to, you know, look after the maintenance and assume all costs um, to their exclusive use area, which would then negate the need for them to make a contribution to the body corporate. So I've got a practical example here from one of our EMA buildings. Uh, there were a whole lot of gardens which, you know, were de facto EUAs and it, it became a bit of a mission for us as the EMA because there were, you know, daily requests in terms of maintenance that the body corporate was meant to, you know, sort of pick up. And when I got an account or a quote to fix a cracked pool, it was time to, you know, jump on and get this all sort of regularized. Um, so anyway, this is just an extract from the rules. Um, they have been CSOS approved. But you know the onus has been thrust back onto the onto the owners uh, to look after it. So I've just got a note in here, just to say that that personally, I, it's not my preference that it is owner responsibility to look after you know the maintenance and and whatnot of the exclusive use areas. Um, you know, just I find you know just from a practical perspective, you know, it makes it very difficult to to get uniformity. Um, you know, and where people don't maintain you know, and the, the issues that arise because of that, then trying to get the enforcement and trying to compel them to do the maintenance, you know, that's another whole can of words, um, you know, which, you know, it's just a, a further complication. Um, and it also makes it very difficult to, you know, capitalize on, you know, you know, to package a larger project where you can, you know, get the economies of scale and ensure that the maintenance is done correctly you know, with the right scopes, you know, and that's, you know, specifically, you know, one of our other EMA buildings, you know, balconies, we've got that exact issue there with our exclusive use areas, you know, there certainly are no EUA contributions being raised, um, and, you know, it's all the, you know, it's, it's, it's not technically, 
you know, a body corporate problem, but, you know, it's, it's easier that the body corporate just takes charge of it, in my opinion. Um, but in this instance, yeah, just because of the dynamic of the scheme and the way it was running and, you know, kind of the, the, the gardens and, and the layout, it just made sense to make it the owner responsibility. But I think just the take out is, is that you can make it owner responsibility and then there's no need for, for a contribution to be raised. Cool. Next slide, Carl. Okay. So this is just, you know, my, my, you know, my our sort of viewpoints in terms of the contributions um, and just some notes for, for managing agents. I think where, you know, where EA contributions are being made. And I think, you know, irrespective of the computation and the methodology, um, I think it is important that there are accounts for a separate control account. Okay. And, you know, depending on quantums and, you know, associated costs, you know, ideally, I think sort of holding the segregated account. Um, you know, I know full well, and I'm sure managing agents have an experience as well, monies that are raised for, you know, whatever reasons are, you know, very quickly absorbed, you know, for alternative, and quick, um, alternative costs. Um, you know, debtors plays a big role there as well. And before you know it, you know, a special levy is raised. I'll just use an example of a special levy, but a special levy may be raised for something that, you know, plugs a hole somewhere else because of, you know, a cash flow budget hasn't been done and you're short or whatever the story is. So I think, you know, as far as possible, I think certainly a separate control account is easily done, you know, through any sort of, you know, decent sort of system. Um, and, you know, depending on, on the quantums, um, you know, I would say ideally in a segregated, you know, account where the cash is, is kind of ring fenced. Um, the computation uh, certainly to be done, certainly to be done um, on an annual basis. Um, I think, you know, during the budget cycle, and, you know, to share it with owners so that they can, you know, there's full transparency, they get by and they understand how it's calculated, they have questions, um, you know, they can be part of the process. I think that's, 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 that's a given. Um, and then, you know, just in terms of the, you know, the points of maintenance consultants who are assisting with the, you know, the maintenance repair and replacement plans, um, you know, just that, you know, the EUAs are, are pointed out and that they, you know, they pay particular attention um, you know, to those, you know, and just to make sure that there is a separate sort of line item and the costs are, you know, well defined and, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of specified, which just sort of makes it easier in the, you know, computing what the contribution is, you know, given the budgetary sort of implications. And, you know, that's, you know, again, you know, we then go on to, I can't overemphasize that, you know, getting someone in and it's not the kind of the glorified handyman to tick the proverbial blocks for CSOS. Um, you know, I think really to, to embrace, you know, the, you know the, the intention of the legislation to get someone in who knows what they're talking about, um, to really assist, you know, in terms of what maintenance is required, you know, over, you know, the, the short to medium sort of horizon um, to assist in the, you know, the budgetary uh, process. And, you know, with that, the EMA, you know, contributions. And then, you know, lastly, just, you know, sort of technically, um, you know, I do believe that, you know, the EUA contribution should be split. There should be an admin contribution um, and the EUA contribution to follow the levy, you know, the, the legislation insofar as levies are concerned. There are administration, sort of day-to-day -day costs, your insurances, rates, taxes, you know, electricity, so on and so forth. And then there's the longer term, you know, maintenance sort of cycles that need to happen. So it should be split, in my opinion, between, between both. And, you know, I have got an example from one of the bigger managing agents in Cape Town where that's exactly what, what they are doing. So it's great to see. Next slide, so come. Okay, sometimes the rules as well, they do specify exactly what, what the contribution is. Uh, this is an example that I got from, from ASI, from Voter, um, where, you know, the rules actually state exactly what the, the EUA contribution is. Um, I've just made a note there just to say, it's, it's, you know, where they specified it, it is quite difficult to kind of interrogate the logic, the logic of the, the formula. Um, and it's, I know it's also split, you know, it's, it's not split between the two. It's just sort of like one amount. Um, so look, it is what it is, um, but it wouldn't be my sort of preference, but you know, there it is. And it's an example. So, you know, be alive to it and don't be surprised if you see it. Um, and that obviously then sort of makes it relatively easier to, to compute it. It's, it's, it's per the rule and it's just a simple sort of, formula. Um, the example below is the one for, from Sandak and Cape Town. Um, I wasn't able to get the logic and the computation, but it's quite a nice example of an actual levy statement, just sort of showing the split for a, for a parking bay EUA. So yeah, there it is there. 
Okay, next one. Okay, um, what I did here was I just used one of our EMA buildings where we've got a we've got the special we've got the SGM nine in sort of September where we're just sort of regularizing you know de facto EUAs and it's actually quite nice just sort of fortuitously um, a lot of the speakers are involved on on this exact one so Zalinda assisted with rules and Aubrey you assisted with the EUA layouts and and sort of measurements. Um, but yeah, and you know, Brian from Project Lab had done the, the maintenance plan. Um, so it, it's all kind of quite nice. So we can just see on the bottom left slide is just a snippet from the maintenance plan. And you know, they were just highlighted the carports, um, you know, with an estimated cost in the next sort of two, three years or whatever it is, um, which is quite nicely there. And then I just put in snippets of the layout plan from, from Aubrey, which you can see is very nicely very nicely done and sort of very easy to, to work with. So this is just the, you know, I thought let's just do an actual example because they're going to have to do it at some stage in any event. So I thought I'd just kill two birds with one stone. So here we go. And Shirley, if you're looking, it's your building. So <laughs> this is what you can expect to see in, in due course. Okay, and then I've just got a, just the, just an example of the computation on the next slide. Okay, right. So just the reserve contribution, just per, per Brian's um, sort of plan, he's estimated 177,000, which we're needing in two years. Um, it's 88 carports. And I'm just having a look here. So on the admin contribution, I'm just chatting to Daniel, the building manager and the staff. We've estimated sort of 10% of their time to sort of cleaning, sweeping, um, you know, and clearing that area. I've got a, an insurance provision. And then I've just estimated common property electricity, given it's a, you know, that area sort of is lightest. So just on the admin side, the one on the right hand side, I've just given the calculation. I'm noting this is just a, an estimated amount, but I think it's sort of reasonably, reasonably accurate. Um, so I've just got the salary cost there. And then I've just slipped it in from the management accounts on the right hand side, just to show the actual sort of numbers. And so 10% of the, the salary cost is the two, you know, 2338. And then just on the insurance provision, it's, it's, it's probably overstated. Mike is the broker on this one. Um, you know, I've just used the 88 at the, you know, the square meterage over the, you know, the full sort of square area. And I've just prorated that against the insurance cost. It, it probably is overstated because, you know, technically the, the carports, I suppose, would be on a building rate. Um, but as I say, it's just a budgetary sort of amount. And then it's the estimated one of the 50% share of the, the common property, which I took off, off last month, um, which gives me a total. And then that comes down to the 64 Rand um, per carport. And then on the left-hand side, I've got the, the calculation for the reserve contribution. And that was just the 177, the number of months. I've just used the corporate saver rate of, of 5.2% because someone will always ask, what about the interest? And the monthly contribution there comes in at the 79.71. And you know, that cumulative cost is it's 144 Rand, um, you know, sort of cumulatively. But that's quite a nice example, and that's the way that that we're approaching this one. And I think it's you know, just listening and seeing what you know estimated amounts are being used by some of my colleagues in sort of context in the industry, it seems there or thereabouts. But this has been done, you know, we've done this quite sort of scientifically. And, you know, and I think it's, you know, for people, for owners that, you know, want to see the rationale and the methodology behind it, it's quite easy to show them and share the calculation with them, which I think is reasonable and fair and sort of satisfy, satisfies the requirements of the, of the legislation. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's pretty much about it from, from my side. Happy to, to field any questions, um, you know, as best I'm able to. And, you know, Mike, happy that you you and Arby and sort of Zalinda, you know, sort of share any comments or associated comments you may or may not have. Okay, I'll kick it off. Um, the, it's, it's interesting. I think we had a dis chat about it briefly the other day. Um, and Michael, wow, I mean, you've done, uh, you're presenting a lot here and, and, and so well done. Uh, even I could follow it. Um, the EOA contribution I saw CSOS mentioned that you don't actually pay CSOS levy on that portion. Do you want to comment on that? Yes, I don't. I don't think so. No. 
No, they don't. But it's just interesting because um, if you think about it, if you're paying a thousand rand a month um, levy, and if you took 200 rand off and allocated that to EUA contributions, there might be a, a saving on, on your CSOS levy. So it's just something to bear in mind. It's not big money, but it could be big money if there are expensive EUAs involved, um, even if it is even across. Um, uh, it is just a point I, I, I thought about on your question the other day. Um, if you do split your, your, you could say split your levy between EUA contribution and um, normal levy, there could be a reduction in CSOS levy a little bit. Nobody likes paying too much tax, do they? Well, I think as little as we have to pay CSOS. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, other than the CSOS contribution, also the calculation of fines. I mean, that's a, a big one for us. And, and Nicole, I'm sure, has got a couple of comments as well. When we have to determine the amount of fines in our conduct rules, the CSOS says that the amount of the fine cannot be equal to or more than a levy. So a lot of the times we have to think about what is that levy? Does that include the reserve fund? Does that include, include an exclusive use? Area contribution? Is it for a utility section, a primary section? Sorry for the dogs barking in the background. They don't agree that it should include all of those things. So these are things <laughs> to take into consideration. Great. And also recoveries for electricity and water. Um, you know, very often people, you know, include that in the, the levy amount, but those also need to be excluded. Any questions? Any hands going up? Michael's okay. opened it up. We've got quite a few questions on the on the chat group. Um, so, Linda, do you want to read them? The, yeah, there's a heap That's of questions. Terrifying. I'm going to start. <laughs> <laughs> oh, going or, to start, or pick one or two. I'm going to start at the at the bottom and work my way up. Um, one that we get asked very often, Serena has raised, is it not easier to include in the conduct rules a rule which makes the owner of the EUA responsible for all repairs, maintenance and replacements of the EUA area and all other EUA improvements as an alternative to trying to calculate the correct and fair EUA contribution? Michael, you mentioned right at the beginning you prefer to not go that route did i hear you correctly yes well i, I yeah i think i think yes just just because otherwise you know if it becomes an owner responsibility we know what it's like that they don't always they don't always carry out the required maintenance um you know and then when you need to compel them to carry out the maintenance then becomes another whole enforcement issue um over and above that um you know if, if i'm looking you know just the balconies is, is the one that i'm currently dealing with in another building um, you know, it, it also makes it difficult to package a, a full project together, you know, because it's the owner's responsibility. So I think it's better to take charge. But, you know, I think it, it also depends on the scheme dynamic. You know, the, the one example that I did use, you know, with the de facto gardens that would now sort of regularize, um, you know, they, they, they're very isolated and, well, not isolated, but they're very independent, you know, to the, the, the section owners. You know, there it does make sense. Um, you know, so I think it, it depends on the scheme, it, it depends on the dynamic, it, it depends on, you know, what is the exclusive use um, and whatnot. But I think, I think as far as possible, um, you know, I just prefer doing it just to make sure that it gets done. But in instances, yeah, certainly, I think it would make sense. But I mean, you know, you, you guys as EMAs know your schemes better. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so Linda, if I can perhaps just add to that, I think one of the problems of leaving it to an owner is the perception of when maintenance is required. Uh, different people have very different perceptions of at what stage something is dilapidated or is unsafe. Uh, and therefore, there's no consistency. And trying to convince an owner that uh, uh, there needs to be some maintenance done when he don't believe that it needs maintenance is quite problematic. And uh, that leads to uh, inconsistency and that negatively affects obviously the co-owners eventually. Yeah, definitely. 
There's one other question that I want to highlight that Sandra um, pointed out. And then, Mike, if I can ask you just to do a little bit of um, uh, marketing, I'm going to steal your, your term for Michael earlier, on your Pearls of Wisdom uh, physical event that you've got coming up. You've got such a, a nice little um, a name for it, but you're not very um, open when it comes to what you guys are going to be talking about on the day. So perhaps while we've got you, you can tell us a bit about what you're going to you guys are going to be chatting about. Um, Sandra asks, and Michael, this is for you, what would be grounds for having an EMA over trustees? I think this is such a nice general um, big question. So basically like, you know, what type of situation would make it preferable to have an executive managing agent over trustees? Well, in my opinion, in every instance. <laughs> I <laughs> do right. No. No, look, I mean, just, you know, in my experience, it's just, you know, trustees, trustees are volunteers, you know, they, they, the meetings are after hours, you know, you guys are starting meetings at six, so it's on seven o'clock at night after the Blimmon trustees go and have dinner, I mean, I've had that before, um, you know, very often it attracts the wrong kind of person, they're pushing their own agendas, um, it's, it's very much, it's very much, you know, post facts, it's not their primary focus. Um, these schemes are businesses, you know, the asset values are, you know, I've seen billion rand asset values of schemes, you know, the likes of, you know, some of the biggest schemes when I was at Trafalgar, like six, 700 million rand turnover businesses, um, you know, and now we've got volunteers, you know, having meetings at seven o'clock on a Thursday night, you know, budget meeting should be at nine o'clock on a Tuesday morning, um, you know, top of mind, you know, complete objectivity, you know, I've got, you know, volunteers now, making decisions and enforcing issues against their neighbors. Um, you know, so I think the objectivity, I think it's professional, it professionalizes it. Um, it's a business that is running. And, you know, it's, it's quite interesting at, at the seminar that you spoke about, I'm gonna talk about, you know, sort of EMAs and, you know, the, the argument for it. And, you know, we've, because it's relatively new and we kind of got into it sort of somewhat fortuitously, um, you know, I've tracked our time spend and our, our kind of cost our cost and our cost recovery, just in terms of savings to the scheme. And I can categorically say that in every instance, you know, our appointments is, is more than self-financing, you know, but it's, you know, trustees generally sort of fixate on the, you know, on the costs, um, you know, and they kind of do sight of the bigger picture and it's that kind of intangible erosion of, of value that they don't always see, um, you know, but just on the actual cost savings, you know, we can see it. And I think it's just, you know, it's, it's just we're running businesses, you know, businesses aren't part-time, but part-time volunteer professionals. Um, you know, look, in some instances, there's some very capable trustees, don't get me wrong. But, you know, in my experience and opinion, it's the exception to the norm. And, you know, shame, managing agents are the one that take the bunts. You know, you work all day and you must go to a meeting, you know, at six o'clock at night and talk about a whole lot of nonsense for 90% of the time and 10% on the actual issues. And again, the more people, the less people can decide. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a non-brainer in, in my opinion. And unfortunately, not often is there a nice cup of coffee or a nice bottle of wine on uh, on offer. So that that really that really does suck. You've got a you've got a, an offer or at least a, a, a request from Colin Fisher of Steer and Co to share your costing methodology to, uh, when you quote for an EMA. So get get. No, it's, it's quite simple. Like I can tell you right now, it's simple. It's, it's it's five and a half grand is our minimum fee. You know, and it's based on five hours you know, and 500 grand for, for incendiaries, and it's, it's based on five hours a month. You know, we'll never, we'll never accept an appointment without a managing agent, you know, someone needs to do the work. Um, you know, but, you know, it's, it's you know, they, one should never spend, more, one should never really need to spend more time than that. Um, you know, and what we typically find, and again, I've, I've tracked the time that we've spent amongst me and the team, you know, quite closely on our appointments. And, you know, generally we're spending 25 to, you know, to 30 hours for the first two months. Um, and then it drops right down as we address the, you know, the compliance and the, the issues in inverted commas, um, you know, which are generally, you know, a combination of apathy, um, you know, lack of willingness of, of people to stand. And then in some instances, you know, some hostility, you know, and dysfunctional boards. Um, but once you address the issues, I mean, it's not actually that difficult, you know, so it's a bit of a time spend up front and then it settles down and it ticks over as a business. I think from a managing agent perspective, it's, it's, it's a, it's a non-brainer. Um, you know, you, you, you're theoretically dealing with, with someone who understands what needs to be done. We know what our job is. We know what your job is. 
you know, there's no bullshit to excuse the French, you know, meetings at nine o'clock in the morning, a budget meeting, you know, your monthly budget meeting should be nothing more than 20, 30 minutes provided it's all running smoothly. And, you know, and it just runs, it's a business. Um, you know, we don't need to overcomplicate it. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Mike, over to you. Okay, so we're spot on 11 o'clock. Um, so I think we're going to, uh, from a, a work point of view, we'll call it a wrap. Um, I've got a few things. We I had it in the background because um, Zalinda was sick and um, Michael wasn't sure uh, whether he would fly through what he was doing or whether he would need a little bit more time. So it's worked out perfectly, I think. Um, and then I'll do some of the insurance financial aspects next week. Uh, and as we drill down into some of the more interesting issues. Okay, so not that today wasn't interesting, Michael, that was fantastic, thank you. But just remind us again, um, so Linda, you can help me here, but yeah, next week is episode three. Uh, episode four might happen um, because things are popping up. We're getting some good questions. I've still got questions that are outstanding. We're um, weaving them in, and if we don't manage to weave them into the actual discussions, then we'll take the questions into an example. I've actually got one little example that I'll keep pending and see if there's time to, to throw it in later. So next week, episode three, and there could be episode four on the 31st. We, we did mention that in the first week. Then on the 18th of August, um, uh, Zalinda TVDM Consultants have a, a, a good webinar um, where Ruth and who else? Uh, I think it's Liche, Liche, yeah. Liche and uh, uh, Ruth are going to be interviewed. I saw the ad for that. That looks good. Um, then the 3rd of September, that's what Zalinda alluded to just now. Um, it's called the Pearls of Wisdom Seminar. Uh, it's a physical one. Um, we're uh, in Arsandavale. There's a little definitive conference center. And um, we've got a few speakers. So if you are in Johannesburg, uh, send me an email if you want the invite. Uh, it is filling up fast. I think there's well over 40 people already registered and we only really started marketing it a day or two ago. Um, then uh, the 20th of September in Pretoria is our big one. We're very excited about that. I think I think all all three of us, all four of us will be there, actually. Um, so um, we, we're looking forward to that. That was what we did in Cape Town or well, Zalinda organized all of that. Aubrey's team are very kindly. Jenny um, especially is helping prepare that one. And I think that one is filling up just as fast as as the Edenvale one. And so, yeah, look at that one. If you want the invite, we can send it to you. And then um, on the 22nd of September uh, would be the September webinar. I believe that's an insurance one. I'm looking forward to that too, to listen in. Um, I'll be a I'll be a listener for a change um, and that'll be a great one looking forward to. And then as time progresses, this this will probably get a little bit longer, but uh, certainly it's been a, a webinar month this month. Okay, <laughs> Zalinda, Thank over you. to you if there's anything you want to add. I think Andre on the chat function summed it up quite uh, aptly. He says, my head is spinning. And he's got a <laughs> little emoticon face with the little uh, like sweat drip coming off his face. He's like, there's a lot going on <laughs> until the end of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. thank you so much for your time. And to my team, I'm sorry for taking over again. It's what I do. Even when I'm sick, I'm not sick. So thank you for accommodating me. Uh, thank you to everyone for their time and uh, keep well. We'll see you next week. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Carl, you're going to stop recording.